And today we have Jake Eamon, who is our Stellar Stewardship Director at the Wells Reserve. And this is part of our Meet the Scientists series. So monthly through the summertime, we get to meet the scientists that work at the reserve because it's not just education that we do, but also research and stewardship. And today, Jake's gonna be highlighting some of the habitat restoration and climate resilience projects he's working on. So um, I am going to, I'm already recording, and I'm going to be monitoring the chat box. And it's such a small crew. If you have a question throughout the program, if you just wanna raise your hand, um, I'll be able to see you and we can, we can pause the presentation and get your question answered. So Jake, take it away. Great, thanks Suzanne. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, my name is Jake Amon. I'm the Stewardship Director here at the Wells Reserve. I've been at the Reserve since 2008 in various capacities. And now I'm very pleased to be running the Stewardship Program here, which encompasses a lot of varied activities from site-based stewardship, um, like managing our grassland and meadow habitats and um, invasive species to our community-based stewardship program, which is more about interfacing with communities and partners to uh, conserve and restore coastal habitat in Southern Maine. And um, so today I'm gonna be talking more about the community-based stewardship work um, we do a little bit of habitat and restoration work on site, but most of this work is taking place elsewhere. And um, so I'm going to just talk sort of in general terms about um, the type of work we're doing and some of the reasons for why we're doing this. And then also I'm going to talk about some specific projects, as Suzanne mentioned, and uh, just give some highlights of some work that we've accomplished over the last few years and also some things that we're currently working on um, and that we hope to, uh, to complete in the near future. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen for most of the presentation, so I won't be able to see anybody. Um, so Suzanne is going to prompt me when there are questions and um, folks can feel free to just, um, like Suzanne said, raise your hand or put a question in the chat. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end. This is sort of an informal uh, format and I'm happy to take questions throughout the presentation. Um, so with that, slideshow here. Apologize for the black box. It's going to go away in just a minute. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so um, this is just a, a quick overview. This is the, um, the three watersheds that um, are part of the Wells Reserve and the, the greenish uh, lined areas here on the map are the boundary for the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve, which encompasses three watersheds, uh, the Agunquit River, the Webb Hannett River, and the Little River. Um, and within each of those watersheds, we have several marsh complexes um, that consist of salt marsh and, and brackish marsh, pools, tidal channels and creeks, uh, frontal dunes and sandy beaches, um, and a whole host of species that inhabit these areas, as well as the communities um, that live in and around them. I've already sort of talked about the stewardship uh, program here, so I'm just going to skip through this. Um, and the first thing that I want to talk about today, um, and it's sort of a, it's, it's a new slash old topic, and that is climate change and more specifically sea level rise. Um, this is, uh, sea level rise is something that's really driving a lot of the work that the stewardship program at the Wells Reserve is involved with. Um, and it's something that is, I think, on the minds of a lot of the communities that we work with. Um, being on the coast, of course, sea level rise um, is going to have a major impact for everything we do in coastal Maine. Um, and so, uh, you know, we really need to be thinking about this in terms of both our habitat and species um, vulnerabilities and also our community vulnerabilities and how we can respond um, and make sure that, that those important assets in our community are safe and will persist into the future. So this is just a, a chart that I'm uh, sharing from a recent report that was put together by uh, the Maine Climate Council. Um, and that was a group of 
uh, well, a whole bunch of different uh, folks from around the state. Um, this came from the, um, the Maine Climate Council Science and Technical Subcommittee, which was responsible for really evaluating what we know scientifically about climate change in the state of Maine and how it's going to potentially affect the state of Maine. Um, so this is a graph that shows a number of different sea level rise scenarios for Maine uh, that was put together by the Maine Geological Survey. And uh, the different colored lines just indicate different future sea level rise scenarios. Um, these are largely based off of uh, work that was done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and was um, part of the national climate assessment that was produced back in 2017 which is going to be updated very soon, I believe. Um, and so each of these is related to um, basically different emissions, different uh, carbon emissions scenarios. So the higher the sea level rise scenario, the more carbon um, greenhouse gases is going into the atmosphere. And so obviously the more extreme end um, of that is, is what we can see here, the red line. Um, this is projecting out to the year 2100, so a little less than 80 years from now, um, far beyond all of our lifetimes, but certainly within the horizon of um, planning for um, both coastal communities and habitat. Um, so 10.9 feet, that's the extreme scenario. I'm not really, we're not really using that one so much, though. That's essentially the do nothing scenario where we just keep um, putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at the rate that we've been doing. Um, hopefully things are going to shift away from that over the next few years and we'll see one of these other scenarios probably, but um, I think right now um, we're pretty confident that this dark green scenario, the 3.9 feet by 2100, is something that we will be seeing in Maine. And that's been uh, recommended by the Maine Climate Council as a target for, for planning in the coastal zone. Um, so as we go through these slides, just be thinking about, you know, think about the places that you know along the coast and where that high tide line is um, when you go down a high tide and then add four feet to that. Think about how that might affect the places that you know and love in coastal Maine. Um, so here's a place that I know and love and I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, this is a, a drone photo that was taken over Drake's Island Marsh and you can see Drake's Island Road here in the foreground, and then the Webb Hannett Marsh in the background and the Webb Hannett Estuary. That little island in the middle of the water is um, Wells Harbor, where the, the town um, pier is, and the gazebo and the, uh, the Webb Hannett Marsh Walk that the reserve helped put in a couple of years ago. Um, and just that narrow little road, that's Harbor Road, uh, coming down the hill there and, and going out to the harbor. So this was a king tide from last year, uh, last November. Uh, king tide is, is essentially the highest annual tide of the year. Um, this wasn't on a day where there was a storm. You can see clear blue sky. So this is just calm conditions, but really high, really high sea level. And this is a great photo because this is, you know, the, the highest annual tide occurs essentially once or twice a year uh, currently. Um, but this is what it's going to look like, um, you know, more and more frequently with sea level rise. Um, and with four additional feet on top of this by 2100, the landscape's going to look dramatically different during these extreme high tide events. Um, the other thing I want to point out in this photo um, is that while you can't see the Webb Hannett Marsh um, because it's underwater, you can see the little patch of Drake's Island Marsh that's on the upstream side of Drake's Island Road. And that is because there, you can't really see it in the photo, but there is a tide gate, a self-regulating tide gate um, associated with the culvert that goes under Drake's Island Road. And that is preventing um, these extreme tides from flooding the marsh on the upstream side here. Um, this is an example of a restoration project that the Wells Reserve was involved with um, dating back to 2004. Um, and what essentially what this project did was um, allow flooding, uh, freshwater flooding on the upstream side to, to flow out and protect these homes while also preventing this marsh, which has, which has lost elevation historically and is much lower than the downstream side, preventing this marsh from getting um, uh, overtopped by, by water on a regular basis, which would have a negative impact for the salt marsh. 
Um, so even though we see some invasive species coming in here, this project actually has probably preserved this marsh, at least for the short term. Um, but the long term impacts of sea level rise are going to have different implications for this marsh. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we're not just concerned about habitat, though that's one of the primary focuses for the Wells Reserve, but we're also concerned about our coastal communities and the, you know, the infrastructure, uh, the homes, and the services that, that folks in these communities rely on. This is a photo of Sawyer Street in Scarborough, uh, looking towards Cape Elizabeth in the Spurlink River uh, estuary. Um, this was a photo that was taken uh, just a couple of years ago in the winter time. And you can see that this road is overtopping. Um, this was following a coastal winter storm, I believe. And you can see ice that has piled up on the road and there's a little bit of standing water on the road and the marsh on either side is completely underwater. So this road um, is essentially at the highest annual tide elevation. Uh, it crosses about a quarter mile of salt marsh and um, it's regularly flooded, at least a couple times a year it's flooded. And now imagine four feet of sea level rise on top of these extreme conditions that we're experiencing now, the road will be completely underwater. Um, this is a site that the Wells Reserve is working on with the town of Cape Elizabeth and the town of Scarborough um, to figure out what to do here. And um, this is one of four north-south roads in Cape Elizabeth. Um, it's more important for Cape Elizabeth than it is for the town of Scarborough, um, but, but it is a road that's somewhat well-traveled. However, um, after a study that was done in 2019 um, by an engineering firm that was hired by the town, um, it became apparent that th to replace the, the failing culvert, which you sort of can't see here, it's underwater, um, and to upgrade and raise the road to keep pace with sea level rise, the towns were gonna have to spend upwards of three to $5 million and they quickly realized, the towns quickly realized that if they had three to $5 million to spend, that this would not be their priority location. The town of Scarborough, which sure most folks are familiar with Route 1 that crosses the Scarborough Marsh there, that road is also in a similar situation where it's pretty close to the marsh. Uh, it experiences periodic flooding, and that's a major route. So for the town of Scarborough, um, when they compared Sawyer Street to Route 1, it was really a no-brainer for them to say, yeah, we are, we're going to put our money um, on these major routes that, you know, that people rely on every day. And so now these towns are going to be, um, they're pursuing funding to conduct a study to actually remove this road and discontinue its use um, and try to restore the marsh here where the, where the road has crossed the marsh. Um, so this is, this is a, an example of the types of decisions that communities are facing. As they, um, as they start to consider the challenges the sea level rise poses for their infrastructure. Um, fortunately, this road is not the only access for the homes uh, that you can see here. There's, there's a, a number of different ways to get to this site, um, but there are things that need to be considered, like if this road is removed, what, where does that traffic that currently uses this road go? Um, what does that mean for uh, road infrastructure elsewhere in town? What does it mean for emergency services access um, and so on and so forth? So um, it's, not a, it's not a simple decision to make, but it's one that the towns are now seriously considering um, because it's just so costly and they have so many other priorities where they need to focus their resources. Um, here's another example of a coastal vulnerability. This is uh, the seawall at Middle Beach in Kennebunk. And um, this, you know, I'm not the only one to get a photo like this down there. This, this looks like this at least a few times a year in, in uh, Kennebunk. Um, you know, here the town has a roadway that is regularly covered with cobble and sand thrown up by these waves. Um, they've got seawalls that are um, being damaged every year and needing to be repaired. Uh, they've got homes right here on the beach that are vulnerable to, to these waves as well as flooding um, that goes around behind uh, the barrier uh, beach area where they've been built. Um, so, you know, again, just another example, imagine this, but with four feet additional uh, height of sea, of sea level rise, um, it's gonna be a major, major problem. I can't imagine, you know, I know that the, one of the major challenges with when thinking about this stuff is, well, what about those homes? Where are those people going to go? 
you know, can we build a wall around this neighborhood and keep the ocean out? When we start having those types of conversations, it really gets expensive and complicated quickly, um, but it's also really um, challenging to think about, you know, what the alternative might be, relocating these homes, abandoning these homes. Um, probably many of these have been, you know, our multi-generational homes that have been in families for years and years and years. Uh, so there's a lot of emotion, uh, a lot of memories tied up, um, wrapped up in these issues. Here is another example of how uh, rising seas and climate change are impacting our coastal resources. So this is a photo from Drake's Island Beach. Um, I think it's a wintertime photo after a pretty big storm. And here you can see that, you know, there is a seawall in that picture, but it's been essentially completely buried by the cobblestones here that are being tossed up off the beach and up into the dune system. These homes were built on the sand dune, um, and, which is common uh, in, in, you know, essentially all over the place. Um, very desirable places to live, but as sea level rises, again, imagine four feet of additional uh, sea level here. Um, you know, that that's a paints a pretty stark stark picture uh, for what these homeowners are going to be experiencing over the next 10, 20, 30, 80 years. And of course, we we're seeing that our we're losing our sand. So where once we had a, a fun sandy beach to put our blankets on, uh, now we've got these uh, uncomfortable cobblestones to sit on. And this is a, this is another photo from the Sawyer uh, Street. Uh, crossing. This is a picture of the culvert. Um, and this photo shows the impact of these undersized uh, structures, uh, culverts and bridges that cannot convey um, an adequate amount of, of tidal flow, uh, cause significant damage to the adjacent marsh. So here you can see this massive uh, round pool that has formed around the, the outlet of this culvert um, as a uh, massive volume of tidal water is forced through this tiny opening. Um, it accelerates rapidly and that high velocity water then scours away the marsh here. And what you can't see because I'm not facing the right direction is that um, this little spit of marsh is maybe 20 or 30 feet wide. And you can imagine over the course of the next 30 or 40 years um, that if this culvert were left in place or replaced at a similar size, it would continue to eat away that marsh and eventually um, it would form a new channel um, that would that would connect with the upstream uh, section around the around the corner um, and and seriously degrade this this piece of marsh. Um, so sites like this are common. Um, the Maine Coastal Program, which is one of our partner organizations housed within the Maine Department of Marine Resources, undertook a project to map most of the tidal restrictions um, in the state of Maine. Um, at both road crossings, but also dams, trails, railroads, and other, other places where we have infrastructure or built routes that, that cross our tidal marshes. And um, so it's a, it's a big problem. It's widespread. Most of the tidal crossings in Maine create restrictions like this, which not only cause this erosion, but they also prevent the, the natural flooding upstream to occur, uh, which these salt marshes rely on to maintain um, both the vegetation, but also their elevation. So one of the natural functions of the marsh is that it accretes uh, sediment. So sediment accumulates on the marsh surface in addition to, um, to dead plant matter, organic matter. And over time, um, that raises the elevation of the marsh. And historically, our salt marshes are, have been able to keep up with the rates of sea level rise, because of course sea level has been going up steadily uh, since the end of the last um, glacier period. Um, and it's been at a pace where uh, sediment has been deposited in the marsh surface at a rapid enough pace to keep up with that, that rate of sea level rise. But now that sea level rise is accelerating due to uh, climate change, um, the, we have a question, you know, is, is our marsh gonna be able to keep up? Four feet over a hundred years, that's a pretty high deposition rate of sediment. So, um, while we want to remove these tidal restrictions to make sure that, um, that that natural flow and flooding can occur upstream, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that um, there could be negative impacts. Uh, increased flooding um, could result in marsh die-off 
where we have too much flooding that the plant that the marsh plants can't tolerate. And so we could actually see a loss of our marshes. And then in addition to, um, you know, that, that's what's sort of occurring on the lower elevation end, on the higher elevation end of, of the marsh, at uh, the upland boundary, um, where it meets, um, you know, fields and forests, um, those areas are going to see increased flooding. You're going to see trees and other uh, shrubs and things along the edge there that can't tolerate salt water start to die off. And then those lower elevation areas um, that do see regular flooding in the future um, could convert to salt marsh habitat. So with sea level rise, we may see a loss of salt marsh in some areas and then a gain of salt marsh in other areas. And we'll look at a map that shows the potential for salt marsh, what we call salt marsh migration into the future in just a minute here. Um, so on the, on the habitat and species side of things, you know, there's certain species that really depend on our tidal marshes and our coastal habitat. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about a couple examples of those. And these are species that are, you know, right on the brink of, you know, potentially, um, you know, going extinct or, or being lost, at least in Maine, um, due to both coastal development, but also sea level rise. This is a photo from the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture. Um, these are, uh, salt marsh sparrow chicks uh, in their nest. And salt marsh sparrows are a bird that nests on the marsh surface. Uh, they use uh, marsh grasses to build their nests and they can actually tolerate a little bit of flooding. Um, they can lay their eggs, hatch and fledge their chicks in about 23, 22 days. And that's about the time between spring tides, monthly spring tides, so these birds have evolved to tolerate a little bit of flooding, um, but they can't tolerate a lot. And what, what happens, of course, is that, um, you know, the temperature regulation for the chicks and the eggs is disrupted if they're submerged in this cold seawater. Uh, the parents obviously aren't on the nest right now. So um, salt marsh sparrows are imperiled uh, along the East Coast and uh, organizations like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are working really hard to um, learn as much as they can about this species and then use that information to help inform coastal habitat management decisions like restoring um, tidal flow in a salt marsh. So this is an example where we think, you know, gosh, these man-made um, road crossings have really damaged our salt marshes and caused, caused harm over the years. Um, but also these birds have become, become accustomed to those locations in the marsh that receive the right amount of flooding. And if we um, restore that natural flow of, of tides, we could potentially be having a negative impact on some of the last remaining populations of this vulnerable species. So, um, you know, it just this just adds further complication to um, to the work of restoring coastal habitat and um, and ensuring that it is going to be um, there for future generations. We also want to make sure that these species are around. So. Um, a lot of issues to consider. Here's another example of a vulnerable species um, that inhabits our, our coasts. This is a rainbow smelt. It's a migratory fish that, um, that lives uh, along the coast of Maine. Um, New Hampshire too, that's about the range. Uh, there's a few smelt populations in Massachusetts. They used to extend as far down as, as Hudson River and maybe even Chesapeake Bay, um, but they those southern populations populations um, are no longer there. So Maine is one of the last uh, strongholds in the United States for this, for this fish species. Migratory fish rely on um, access to our coastal freshwater streams for reproduction edge of the, the freshwater saltwater interface. So they spawn um, in areas just upstream of the head of tide that's that's the extent of tidal flooding in our estuaries. And um, so you can imagine as sea level rise increases, that area of, you know, that's just above the salt water is going to move um, as salt water intrudes further and further up into our freshwater streams. So this is another species that, you know, sort of exists in a, a narrow niche um, of conditions that are going to be changing um, as sea level increases. And so this is just another you know, another complicating factor where we want to do no harm uh, when we're 
pursuing restoration and resilience projects in coastal Maine. And so we need to be sure that we're considering these little critters. Another example would be the piping plover, um, which nests in our sand dunes, which are also um, heavily impacted by sea level rise and coastal development. And there's numerous other examples, rare plants and animals um, that are just hanging on in these, this narrow fringe between the upland and the ocean. Um, I'm gonna pause there, Suzanne, I can't see you guys, but have there been any questions? No questions yet, but um, maybe we just pause a minute. If anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask it. Okay. This, uh, this is Linda. Hey, Jacob. Um, so I live in um, Wells and there's huge tracks of what used to be um, salt marsh grasses that have been now converted to sand because of inundation. Is there anything that can be, um, are, are there any plants or, or remedial um, actions that we can take to prevent that, you know, further erosion of the, uh, the existing marsh, basically, from inundation? Well, um, yeah, so it's, it's a sort of a, a complicated question because we don't want to prevent inundation in our salt marshes. What we want is we want the right amount of inundation. So salt marsh exists somewhere between uh, mean sea level and the mean highest daily tide elevation. Um, and on the lower end of that, you have more flood tolerant uh, vegetation like Spartina alterniflora. And on the higher end of that, you have much less flood tolerant species like Spartina paintings um, and Disticlus. So we want to maintain the right elevation of our marshes so that they are existing within that range of flooding. But as sea level changes and that flood elevation range changes, we want our marshes to be able to build up their elevation um, through ideally through natural processes, um, but we may have to intervene. And so the mitigation, there's a number of different mitigation techniques that are being used in our marshes. Um, before we can even address those elevation problems, there are historical agricultural and, and um, mosquito control alterations in our marsh that need to be addressed. So mm -hmm. we have, um, you know, historically our marshes were used for salt hay farming um, to mm -hmm. provide fodder for livestock. And so that involved building um, these extensive series of dikes and ditches um, to, to um, keep out salt water and allow the marsh to drain. Mm -hmm. um, and those, you know, those are, a little bit hard to see these days um, because they've sort of, um, you know, they've sort of subsided into the marsh a little bit, but they're still there. And what those features have done is change um, the surface hydrology of the marsh. And so hydrology is essentially um, how does water move over the surface of the marsh? And um, there are researchers that are working on this at US Fish and Wildlife Service and other partners. Um, the Great Marsh, um, uh, in Massachusetts is an example where um, they're actually doing extensive mapping of these features, these ditches and dikes. I think they've mapped you know, literally thousands of different dikes and ditches within the Great Marsh. And they're systematically going through that marsh and trying to make small adjustments, um, filling in ditches um, or excavating ditches, depending on how much surface area is there and how much water would sort of, you know, what the natural channel system might look like in a marsh of that size. So before we can, before we can start addressing that marsh elevation question, first we have to address the marsh hydrology issue. Ponding of water on the marsh surface is causing vegetation die off. Um, and so that's another issue that we're worried about with sea level rise. So if we can get the marsh hydrology under control, then we can start thinking about adding sediment to that marsh surface to build the elevation over a time. Mm -hmm. And that's a technique known as thin layer deposition. Um, it often takes place in places like Wells Harbor where there's a, a navigational channel that's dredged uh, periodically to maintain that channel which fills in. 
Um, and so that's a natural source of sediment that can be used to put on the marsh surface. Uh, so the Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge is actually um, developing a number of different restoration projects on the Webb Hannett Marsh. They've received a few different grants over the last couple of years, and they're going to be doing some of these marsh mitigation projects. Um, so, you know, keep an eye out for more information from them about that. And we'll certainly be, um, you know, watching that closely as well and hopefully partnering with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, that'd be great because I can tell you around my, uh, Mile Road, it's following the natural, um, you know, uh, path of the, uh, the, the Webb Hannett River, but it's been in the last two years that you've gone from this huge, you know, foot, several football field size area that used to be grass and used to, you know, to what is now just this expanse of sand since all of the vegetation has been removed. And that's not, you know, that's not slowing down because of the continued sea level rise. And it's just as uh, a little disconcerting. Yeah. Yep, and we'll see, you'll notice areas where the, the stream banks are eroding and the marsh peat is falling into the channel. You know, we're gonna see that kind of thing. You know, it, it is alarming to see that. That sediment that's falling into the channel, hopefully will get deposited back up on the marsh surface. So marsh lost in one area is hopefully marsh gained in another. One of the challenges that we're facing in communities like Wells, um, there's lots of other communities that are facing this issue, is that there is a limited sediment supply within our system. And sediment is constantly moving back and forth. That's why we have to dredge the harbor. That's why our beaches um, are covered with rocks in the wintertime, but then look nice and sandy in the summertime. Right now, the plan for, for Wells Harbor is to, when they do their next dredge, is to take that material and deposit it on the beach. Well, there's only a certain amount of sediment to go around. Um, and right now the beaches are the priority um, for obvious reasons, um, because that's what draws, you know, all the tourists here. It's a major engine for our local economy. Um, but there is interest in using some of that material to, um, to nourish our, march our marshes. But the marsh is a place where that sediment is essentially gonna get locked up for, for decades. Um, so any sediment that we take out of the harbor and we put on the marshes is sediment that's not going to be available to for beach nourishment activities in the future. So that is a challenging question that um, people who know more than I do are going to have to figure out. Um, but it's just, you know, again, another example of how um, we may not be able to have it all. We can't, we might not be able to have our beaches and our coastal properties and our salt marshes. Um, so yeah, and I know that the town of Wells is currently updating their comprehensive plan. And, uh, you know, a lot of these issues are going, hopefully going to be given some treatment within that document because Wells really needs to think about the future of these, these coastal areas. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Good question. And it sounds like Lucy had the same question, so. Yeah, it's similar, but it's a little different. Can I ask it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the place in question, um, in my case, it's in Freeport. And, um, and it's a really small public beach with a, with a marsh. It's part marsh and part beach. And the, I, don't, I don't know the whole history there, but um, the marsh part of it is degrading really, really super quickly. And I was wondering if there's a... Uh, citizen or or actually doesn't necessarily not citizen is there any kind of monitoring program for marshes um, that I'd love to I'd love to be able to report on this one um, yeah so the the state has a number of different monitoring programs um, I don't know of a citizen uh, science citizen science isn't the term we're using anymore I can't remember what the new one is but um, maybe community science or something like that. Community science, I think, yeah. So that it includes <laughs> citizens and non-citizens of the U.S., yeah. yeah. Right, that's good. Um, yeah, so I'm not aware of a community science program that tracks marshes. Um, 
there is a coastal erosion monitoring program, the Southern Maine Beach Profile Monitoring Program. Uh, it doesn't extend up as far as Freeport, unfortunately. Um, I know that, you know, that mid coast area, Northern Casco Bay, um, it's a little bit different than the Wells area where down here we have these barrier dune systems and these, these back, um, uh, back area marshes that are protected by those dunes. Um, yeah, when I go up to, to the mid coast area, um, I see that, you know, we have a little bit less protected marsh um, that's just right on the front of these beaches. Um, and so they're experiencing a lot more of that direct wave action and a lot more of that erosion over time. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to show um, a mapping tool. So one second here. So, ah, here we go. Um, so this is an online map that is um, produced by the Maine Geological Survey. It's called the Maine Beach Mapping uh, Program. And this shows essentially rates of change for our sand dunes. Um, it doesn't show marshes, but this is the kind of thing that you're talking about. And I can sort of zoom out here and we can go up to Freeport. I think it goes that far north. Navigate around here. <clears throat> well, it doesn't look like they have anything in the Freeport area. Um, but yeah, so there are, you know, there are folks that are kind of keeping track of this. Um, Casco Bay Estuary Partnership is, is one of those organizations, Maine Geological Survey and the Maine Natural Areas Program, which is part of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. Um, they have a tool that maps, um, that maps the extent of our marshes. I don't know that they're mapping change over time. Um, so I'm jumping around a little bit here, but um, I wanted to share this tool as well. Uh, this is a web map called um, uh, Potential Tidal Marsh Migration. Um, so this shows areas that are, the, the dark green is existing tidal marsh, and then the light green are areas that could become marsh um, under a three, in this case, a 3.3 foot sea level rise scenario. You'll see different sea level rise scenario numbers depending on which tools you're using. These are based on the 2014 National Climate Assessment, but I know that the Maine Natural Areas Program is currently working on an update which will incorporate uh, the more recent sea level rise scenarios. So just looking at, um, well, let's go to Freeport. Now. <clears throat> oh, okay. So I love all these mapping tools that have been created. They're so, um, they're you know, relatively simple. They don't have a lot of information on them, so they're not too complicated to interpret, um, but they just include a lot of, um, of detail and you can really zoom in and see different areas that you're interested in. So I don't know if you can point me to the area you're talking about, but. Um, sure. um, it's so it's. Um, uh, it's just north of the Harasukit Harbor and village. Oh, it's right near the, um, the sewer treatment plant. There are four little white, white circles on the land uh, just north of the village. And um, yeah, Porter's Landing. So it's just south of Porter's Landing, um, and just south. Okay. Yep, down yeah. Here. So there's a little beach there. It's actually yeah. It's owned by the town. Um, there's a little dock. Okay. It's on the. It's on the the point. It's on that. Oh yeah, point. I see that. Yep. 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 So um, yeah. Uh, so I. I've noticed that, yeah, the plant species have changed quickly. There's actually pretty major erosion happening. Um, and then just a lot, of, just a lot of change. And there's um, horseshoe crabs now, of course, which is great. Um, but I would love, I was thinking, gosh, because it is public, it could be a really terrific small, pro and it's really small. Um, it would be, I think it'd be a cool small project to do um, restoration wise, hmm. if that was even appropriate. I don't even know if it would be. Yeah, so um, um, the 
Casco Bay Estuary Partnership, the Maine Coastal Program, uh, Maine Geological Survey have been partnering over the last couple of years on a project to pilot um, what's called living shorelines. Mm. And that is essentially a, a technique for shoreline stabilization <clears throat> that uses natural materials, um, uh, logs, oyster shells, um, uh, coir, like coconut fiber, mats. Mm -hmm. um, so they've been piloting the use of those to try to slow down coastal erosion in places like this. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe there's a report uh, available that talks about how those are, how those are going. Um, I think it's working well in some places and not so well in others. And so it's definitely still a technology that's under development. There's not a lot that can be done in these areas. I mean, we really, you know, it's, this is very exposed. Um, so you're getting direct wave action. I mean, it's in this Harbor, so you're not, you know, it's not experiencing the type of waves that you would get, you know, on this side of Freeport. Um, but yeah, it's going to be tough. I mean, we're going to see little little places like that that people know and love and, and have enjoyed visiting start to disappear. Um, and, you know, it would be, at the very least, it would be good to be tracking that change. Whether or not the, the town of Freeport is able to do anything to prevent it is another question. Um, yeah. and I wish I had a better answer for you. Yeah, and I also thought, you know, we could also potentially just put up, I, I think part of the problem is also, it's a combination of the high tides and also the, the foot traffic. Um, and we don't even have any kind of um, signage about that. So, um, and I, it's hard for me to know really what's going on, you know, but I just think it's a combination. And then there's the green crabs too. Um, green crabs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Another, to me, it's, just, it's a great opportunity for a way, uh, to show people. Yeah, absolutely. Public. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any high traffic area like that, it's a great opportunity for education. Um, and that's, you know, those are places that more people are going to be um, concerned about too. So oftentimes places that people know and love and are more familiar with are the ones that get, you know, more protection. Um, I think, you know, from a, this is always a challenge because you, you have multiple scales that restoration and resilience work goes on at. Um, you sort of have the large regional scales where, you know, an organization like um, like Maine Coastal Program um, or Maine Natural Areas Program, they're looking for probably at bigger areas. Where where can they get the most impact for the resources that they're putting into restoration activities? But then you have the local scale where you have a community that says, well, you know, this is, these are the resources that we have. They may not be as significant as some of the others in the state, but they're important to us and, and, and this is a place where we can make a difference. So I think, you know, the response to sea level rise is gonna vary from community to community and from place to place within those communities. It really is gonna be dependent on um, political will, uh, local resources and, and the ability of community members to engage and, you know, and advocate for those special places. Um, we can't save everything everywhere, unfortunately. I think that's just going to be kind of the reality that we're faced with. Um, but there is hope to, you know, to conserve our coastal habitats in some areas. And, um, you know, it's kind of a race against time right now to, to do as much as we can before, um, you know, we have some irreversible loss in these places. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jacob. Sure. Um, Okay, well, I'm going to, um, I think I'm just gonna talk about a couple of these tools that I'm sharing right now, um, just in the last few minutes here, um, because you know, I think this is, this is the type of, of information that I think um, could be beneficial at the local scale uh, for communities that are wrestling with coastal resilience issues, um, and trying to decide you know, where they can have the best impact within their communities. Um, you know, again, these are relatively simple um, mapping tools that show a limited amount of data, uh, but it's really powerful. So uh, the first one that I'm going to talk about is the sea level rise and storm surge uh, mapper, which is created by the Maine Geological Survey. This mapping tool includes um, the, the newer sea level rise uh, scenarios from the 2017 National Climate Assessment. I'm going to just turn on that 10.9 foot 
sea level rise scenario here so you can see what that looks like. It's just going to take a minute to load. Um, and what this tool does is basically shows you areas on the landscape that, based on their elevation um, from, from what we call LIDAR data, that's uh, airborne um, data that's collected uh, using uh, light um, uh, laser sensors to basically sense the elevation of the land. Um, and so they, they take that elevation data of the land and then they use the water elevation and they've created these nice maps um, that show those areas of inundation. Not sure why this is not turning on here. Well, as I, of course, as I tout these online tools, they're not working. Uh, it's probably something on my end. But um, in any case, um, let's turn that three point back on. So you can kind of, you know, zoom into your community, you can scroll around, you can see the areas that are gonna be most heavily impacted. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of things that I'm looking at on this map. So this is Drake's Island in Wells. There's the Wells Reserve here in the, in the top center of the map. And um, there's two things that I wanna point out. The first is the most obvious, which is this area of Drake's Island, which I'm gonna zoom in on now. And, you know, what immediately pops out? It's the roads and the houses that are in these areas that are inundated by sea level rise. And so, I mean, that's the majority of Drake's Island is going to be experiencing regular flooding um, in future sea level rise scenarios. So, you know, this is, um, this is a big deal. Uh, these areas, they're people's homes. They're also uh, a major percentage of the, the local municipal tax base. Um, so it's not just about um, it's not just about habitat. It's also about uh, money that we use to fund our schools and our emergency services and pay for you know, pay for infrastructure. Um, and all of these folks, uh, you know, many of these are probably summer homes, but a lot of these are permanent residents, and um, you know they're going to have to relocate. Where are they going to go? Does this mean does this mean that families that have lived in these communities for generations are going to have to leave? Um, will they be able to afford to relocate within the town um, or will, will they have to move someplace else? So that's the first thing I want to highlight in this map. And then the second thing I want to highlight here um, is this area, which is mostly on undeveloped land. Um, and this is sort of a hopeful um, thing for sea level rise where we consider that this is an area that will be able to convert to uh, future marsh um, area um, if if it's allowed to, if this, if this road crossing down here isn't restricting those tides, um, without actually really having any, any negative impact um, on homes or businesses or infrastructure. Um, there may be some species in these areas that are displaced, uh, these upland areas um, you know, that support uh, deer and, and coyote and, and even um, vulnerable species, imperiled species like New England cottontail. Um, unfortunately, there's not much we can do about that except hopefully uh, we've got some other adjacent areas that are undeveloped that they can move into. So that's the sea level rise and storm surge mapper. Um, and I, you can just find that by, by Googling it or you can go to the main geological survey website. Um, I've already talked about this uh, main beach mapping uh, tool. In addition to the shoreline, uh, or this is actually the, uh, the dune um, uh, position data, there's a whole bunch of different layers. Um, most of these web tools are made with um, within uh, ArcGIS online. Um, and so they have similar, um, similar buttons. This is the layer list. And so you can turn this on and you can see if I turn on shoreline position, it shows, if we zoom in, it shows these dotted lines show where the shoreline um, has been historically and how it's changed over time. Um, so this is a, another great tool for looking at coastal change. Um, it doesn't project the future, um, but I think there's some inferences that can be drawn from looking at the rates of change in some of these areas. Um, this tool we've already looked at, this is the marsh migration tool. It's similar to the sea level rise um, tool, uh, a lot of the areas overlap, um, but this focuses specifically on marshes. And so, um, it won't show like an area on Drake's Island where there's development. It won't show that area as supporting future salt marsh because um, it's because of obvious reasons that you're not going to have salt marsh plants growing on pavement 
Uh, but that's not to say that things might not change over the course of the next 80 years um, as people decide to potentially pack up and move or those, those lots become you know, uninhabitable. Um, and we've seen this in other parts of the country following Hurricane Sandy on Long Island. There was a program developed by the, by the, um, the state of New York to buy out coastal landowners and essentially revert those, those beachfront lots back to sand dune and natural conditions. Um, you know, it's expensive to do that and um, not everybody is, is hot on that idea, um, but that is, the, that is a potential solution to restore these um, barrier beach areas back to a natural condition by removing the structures that are there. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a major undertaking, um, but it's something that could be done uh, given enough money and enough, um, enough willpower. Um, this is the last tool that I'll share today. There, there's others that are out there. Um, this is called uh, the Coastal Risk Explorer, um, and it was put together by the Nature Conservancy. Um, it also includes a little bit of outdated sea level rise um, scenarios now. You can see here on the left-hand side of this toolbar um, that they've got one, two, 3.3, and six feet. These, these are um, the from the 2014 National Climate Assessment. I don't know if this tool is planned to be updated in the near future or not, but, but this is a neat tool because what it does is it shows, not only is it showing, um, in this case, uh, sea level rise, I'm gonna just put, let's say, put it on 3.3 feet again. Again, this is Drake's Island um, in Wells, but it also shows the location of, of buildings and roads that would become inaccessible or inundated under these sea level rise scenarios. And they use some fairly coarse level information um, about um, uh, road, the, road, the number of roadways um, and the linear feet uh, within the town to provide these estimates for how much it would cost to upgrade the roads to be above, um, above the elevation where they're getting flooded. So in this case, this particular area of wells, they're estimating $20 million um, to, to um, raise the roadway so that they're not flooded. Of course, that doesn't, you know, there's a number of different logistics that you would have to think about if you're raising a roadway, like you would also need to raise somebody's driveway four feet. <laughs> you need to raise their home four feet. Uh, you can't just raise the road and solve the problem. So it's not as simple as that, but this is a neat tool just for showing sort of the magnitude of the problem in different areas. And if we zoom out a little bit, you can see, um, you know, that this problem just continues down the coast. Here as Wells Beach. Essentially, every single address on Wells Beach is inaccessible because all of the access roads, Mile Road, um, and so on, are you know are inundated um, by by sea level rise. So again, major questions, coastal resilience questions, need to be addressed by these communities, um, both to ensure the health and safety of of community members, um, but also to ensure that our our coastal habitats are functioning into the future. Um, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, we've gotten to another hour. I'm always surprised that, that I can talk for a whole hour. Um, and I guess there's a few more minutes if anybody has any additional questions. Otherwise, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I, hope I, I hope I was able to give you some hope for the future. <laughs> it looks pretty bleak, but I, you know, there are organizations like Wells Reserve and others that are working together to try to come up with solutions to these issues. Um, one other thing I'll just mention real quickly is that the Wells Reserve is working with the Southern Maine Planning and Development Commission um, on a really neat project right now called Climate Ready Coast Southern Maine, uh, where we're engaging 10 coastal communities between Kittery and Scarborough to identify vulnerabilities to coastal hazards like sea level rise and coastal erosion, and then work with those communities to prioritize areas for for future projects where we can try to solve some of these issues. Uh, we're in the vulnerability assessment phase right now, and over the next year, we'll be working with those towns to identify um, areas of, of high priority, and then we'll be producing a climate adaptation, coastal adaptation plan for Southern Maine that will hopefully help guide future actions. So stay tuned for that um, on our website as well. And thanks very much for coming. Thanks so much, Jake.
Gosh, lots of great information. And I think I echo everyone else's sentiments about the mapping tools. Those are really cool. Um, any last burning questions from anyone in these last couple minutes we have? This is Barbara. Um, I wonder whether Jacob has any knowledge have the communities, these coastal communities, at least stopped allowing buildings, uh, building projects in the areas that would be questionable about in the future? Um, that's a that's a really good question. Um, it varies from community to community. So in Cape Elizabeth, for example, um, they've established uh, three foot three feet above the highest annual tide is their shoreland regulatory zone um, so that's an example where a town has actually taken a proactive approach to to regulations um, and so they're limiting development within that area but um but yeah in other places you know you can see development i was down um can't re remember the name of the road in wells but i i went down there the other day um and there was a subdivision going in right adjacent to the marsh. And I'm just thinking, uh -huh. like, wow, you know, like in 30 years, um, some of those homes that are closer to the edge of that, of that subdivision are probably getting flooded. And it just really shows a lack of foresight. But unfortunately, you know, this type of thinking has not permeated down to the, that level. You know, developers, real estate agents, they're not thinking about what's going to happen 30 years from now. And I, you know, I'd like to see changes. Um, you know, I think there should be a rule that says that a real estate agent, if they're selling a home that's within, uh, you know, a certain elevation of, of the sea level that they have to disclose that, um, you know, they have to say future sea level rise predictions say that your property might be in a flood zone in 30 years. Because realistic, I mean, a, a mortgage is 30 years long. So yeah, you buy a home, you expect to be there 30 years from now. You want to know if you're going to be dealing with sea level rise. Um, and then mm -hmm. yes, of course, towns should not be permitting development of those areas because that's going to cause major problems. There's going to be disruptions to services. Um, you know, so those types of recommendations, I think, are are in the works. I mean, the Maine Climate Council, I highly encourage anybody that's interested to visit the Maine Climate Council website, read the reports that they put together. They're not just assessing the impacts of climate change, but they're also making recommendations for things that communities can do and things that can be done statewide to address what's coming. So great question. Um, and of course, people that are concerned about this can engage with their towns um, and provide, and when there's public input opportunities, like right now in Wells, um, they're redoing their comprehensive plan. That's an opportunity to actually help um, influence how, how your community is addressing these issues. So I encourage folks to look into that as well.